Being a medieval king had its benefits. Ample food, a comfortable home, servants to wait on you, all the finest high fashion. It was a good life, but it wasn't without its perils. The most notable, or at least the most feared among the nobility of those times, was assassination. A knife in your back or poison in your dinner were common ways that an unpopular ruler might meet his untimely demise, but they required a kind of access that was typically only available to a select few. If you were a commoner who was dissatisfied with the rule of your betters, you had significantly fewer options. Open rebellion was dangerous, and moving to another realm was usually outside your means. So, if you were a regular citizen and wanted to dispose of a king in discreet fashion, you had to resort to… alternative methods to achieve your nefarious ends. Using magic to murder someone in a game or movie is common enough, but some people actually attempted to do this in real life, or at least plotted to do so. Today, we're going to take a deep dive into one such case, when a group of men conspired to murder King Edward II of England and some of his closest confidants, not with blades or poison, but with necromancy. Let's first set the scene by telling you about the potential victims of this magical assassination plot. If you've seen the movie Braveheart, you might remember the scene where the king tosses his son's <clears throat> good friend out a window. That son is the future Edward II, and his friend, known as Philip in the movie, is a stand-in for a real person named Piers Gaveston, though the close nature of their friendship might have been exaggerated by later chroniclers. After Edward became king, his barons forced him to exile Gaveston, though he was eventually recalled to England, only to be murdered by the barons in 1312 due to the perceived favoritism granted him by the king. Fast forward ten years and England is embroiled in a civil war. On the king's side are the Earl of Winchester, Hugh Despenser the Elder, and his son, Hugh Despenser the Younger, who was granted several holdings at the expense of other lords and even Edward's wife, Queen Isabella. As close allies of the king, both men wielded outsized power and were considered greedy and corrupt by their peers and subjects. Hugh the Younger was especially hated, as he was known to have engaged in acts of murder, piracy, bribery, and extortion, repeatedly using his status as the king's favorite to enrich himself and escape consequences. In addition, Hugh the Younger was thought to have replaced Gaveston as the king's <clears throat> good friend, to the point that he was once called the king's husband. The king won the civil war, granting the loyal dispensers even more lands and wealth, and making them even more unpopular with the high and low classes alike. So it's easy to understand how some people might have wanted all of them dead, and would have gone to extreme measures to achieve their goal. In the winter of 1323 and 1324, certain citizens of the city of Coventry hatched a plot against their prior, who, quote, had been supported by the royal favorites in oppressing the city of Coventry. Those royal favorites were the two dispensers. The exact nature of that oppression isn't made clear, but seeing as how King Edward had just engaged in a civil war and the dispensers were known for their corrupt nature, I'd guess that high taxes probably played a part in it. On November 30th, 1323, 27 men of Coventry went to a certain John of Nottingham, who was apparently a renowned necromancer, or at least good enough to convince all of these men that he could help them carry out their dirty deed. Maybe he had good Yelp reviews. Their targets were the King, the Dispensers, the Prior, and two of the Prior's servants. John of Nottingham had the men procure seven pounds of wax and two yards of canvas. From this, he and his assistant, Robert Marshall, created seven effigies, six of the primary targets, and one of a man named Richard Dissot who was to be a test case for their magic. John and Robert went to, quote, an old ruined house under Shortley Park, about half a league from the city of Coventry, which sounds like the exact kind of place you'd expect a pair of necromancers to do their work, and labored for months on the likeness of Richard de Sceaux. Then on, the Friday after the Feast of the Holy Cross, about midnight, the said Master John gave to the said Robert a brooch of lead with a sharp point and commanded him to push it to the depth of about two inches in the forehead of the image made after Richard de Sceaux, by which he would prove the others. Fortunately, magic isn't real, so nothing happened at- oh, wait, something did happen? According to court documents, Robert Marshall paid Richard de Sceaux a visit the next day and found the said Richard screaming and crying haro and without knowledge of anybody having lost his memory. And so the said Richard lay languishing until the said Master John drew out the said leaden brooch from the forehead of the said image made after the said Richard and thrust it into its heart and thus the said roach remained in the heart of the image until the Wednesday following, on which day the said Richard died. The reason we have court documents of this whole affair is because Robert Marshall turned his master into the authorities before their magic could be tested against more prominent targets. 
Nobody was found guilty of murder, but a man did die somehow. So what really happened? We'll never know for sure what led to the death of Richard Dassault, or why Robert Marshall went state's evidence, but here's what I think is a plausible scenario. While people in medieval times believed more strongly in magic than we do today, there were still some skeptics. It's not hard to imagine that some of the 27 men who approached John of Nottingham didn't believe wholeheartedly in his supposed powers. John himself might have known that he didn't have the ability to assassinate a king or anyone close to him, but the men were offering him a lot of money to carry out the deed, so he felt compelled to make them believe in him, and Richard de Sceaux was selected as the unfortunate test case for their plot. Having a reputation as a magician of sorts probably meant that John had in his possession various uncommon substances and chemicals, a few of which may have been poisonous. I'm no toxicology expert, especially when it comes to 700-year-old murders, but the symptoms ascribed to Dassault, while the motions and memory loss, could be attributed to mercury poisoning. The phrase mad as a hatter comes from the dementia associated with Victorian-era hat makers who used mercury compounds in their profession. So, in this scenario, John or his assistant Robert found a way to administer a toxic substance to Richard Dassault and, when the time was right, stabbed their effigy and claimed it was the reason why Dassault went mad and then died. If any of the 27 men still harbored doubts about the efficacy of John's powers, that surely would have convinced them. One question that remains, though, is how deeply involved was Robert Marshall and what led him to go to the authorities? The records show that John ordered Robert to stab the effigy and also sent him to check up on Dassault. If John was the one actually doing the poisoning and Robert's faith was less than total, these actions could have convinced Robert that he was the trigger man in the murder, reinforcing his belief and his culpability. In that case, maybe Robert's conscience wouldn't allow him to participate in what he perceived as a real and dangerous plot against his king, and he turned himself in, hoping for a lesser sentence by betraying his master. Or maybe Robert was in on the scheme from the start, and the two simply had a falling out over money. Whatever the reason for his betrayal, Robert's duplicitous ploy appears to have worked in his favor and to the detriment of his master. According to the court documents, John of Nottingham, quote, died in prison on the day he was in custody while Robert Marshall was released into the custody of one Robert Dumbleton. Most of the 27 men of Coventry were acquitted, though a few vanished into the countryside, and nothing more is said of them or of Robert. As for the would-be targets of the assassination, maybe they would have been better off if they'd been bumped off in 1324. Soon afterwards, Edward II sent his wife, Queen Isabella, to France to negotiate with her brother, King Charles IV. Once there, she became, <clears throat> good friends with Roger Mortimer, one of the barons who had opposed Edward in the Civil War of 1322 and been imprisoned in the Tower of London only to escape to exile in France. Neither of them were fans of the Dispensers and the power they wielded over Edward, so they assembled an army and invaded England in 1326, eventually forcing Edward to abdicate in favor of his and Isabella's son, who became Edward III. The former king died in captivity the next year, with the most gruesome account of his demise being that he had a red-hot poker shoved up his royal rear. Compared to the Dispensers, though, he got off pretty easy. They remained loyal to Edward II and were captured during the invasion. Hugh Dispenser the Elder was hanged, beheaded, and then had his body cut into pieces and fed to dogs. Bad as that sounds, even he got off easier than his son. Hugh Dispenser the Younger was charged with... <sighs> treason, theft, piracy, murder, false imprisonment, seizing royal power, losing a battle against Scotland false and treacherous counsel, seizing wealth and lands from the church, the queen, and other nobles, attempting to murder the queen, and probably kicking the queen's dog if she had one. To one woman whose husband he had killed, he had her beaten and shamefully had her arms and legs broken against the order of chivalry and contrary to law and reason, by which the good lady is forevermore driven mad and lost. For his crimes, the younger dispenser was stripped naked, had Bible verses cut into his flesh, was dragged through the streets, hanged until he was almost dead, eviscerated, drawn and quartered, and decapitated. According to one account, he also had his genitals cut off while he was still alive. Both the charges and the punishment may have been embellished a bit, either by contemporaries or later writers, to make Hugh Dispenser the Younger seem even more wicked, but he was, by all accounts, not a good person. Some of his remains were returned to his widow, who buried them four years later. In 2008, human remains were found in an abbey graveyard that are thought to be the rest of him, based on the parts found and their condition. If there are any real necromancers out there, I think I know where you can find someone who would love to be raised as a vengeful spirit. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you were entertained by this look into a magical assassination plot in medieval England. Please like and subscribe if you were and want to see more videos about the real history of magic and fantasy. 
Until next time, remember to always do your research and get some good references before you hire a necromancer to murder a king. <laughs>